And now for another excellent score, this time from David. And I just, <laughs> I really enjoyed this. It reminded me in some ways of some of my approaches, not so much that David um, anticipated what I was doing or, or did something that was all that similar, but more that certain approaches that I took and approaches that Dave took have a resonance with each other, right? It's like it's not like we did the same things at the same times, but more that certain approaches that we both took um, kind of reflect each other a little bit. Okay, so uh, that said, and even though I really love this score, of course I'm going to pick it apart a little bit and uh, point out a few things that could improve, maybe um, maybe that could be adjusted or changed or whatever. But anyhow, um, David, I feel that this is a score that you should try to get performed or 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 even just like a orchestral reading if you have access to players or if there's like a reading session or something like that. In fact, I kind of imagine, wouldn't it be funny if um, orchestral reading sessions, uh, you know, when, when they have calls for scores, assuming we all get back to normal uh, within time for this to be relevant, if they all started getting <laughs> orchestration challenge scores, you know, um, like last year's Mussorgsky or, or the year before that Bartok or this year, this piece being played a lot by Lily Boulanger, um, yeah, it would be really fun. Okay, so having said that, let's take a look at, uh, we're going to take this apart a little bit. Okay, so um, there is a lot of thought put into the bowing patterns of, you know, and the slurring and everything else in both winds and strings. So that's really, you know, really good point. Um, there are a lot of uh, unique touches, I, I feel, like um, a lot of, of adaptation of the material rather than transcription. And it's just some ingenious stuff right in here. So um, you know, there are a few things <clears throat> that you need to think about, David. Like, like right in here, I feel if you're going to have four-part harmony in your horns, then the approach that you're taking here should be consistent throughout, right? So um, it would really be better for the, uh, <clears throat> for the second horn to take the lower middle part right in here, um, if possible. And you know, and then just keep that consistent throughout. So, so sometimes you're doing it in the standard layout. Uh, sometimes you're not. So I would just say keep it consistent throughout. Now, as for some of some of this other scoring right in here, um, yeah, I mean it's it's a it's kind of a question like this voice crossing right in here. I I sort of feel that these two parts could have been switched around, right? And possibly scored a little bit differently, maybe with the low horns on the harm on more on the harmony parts and the high horns, you know, coming together. I mean, I mean, there's nothing about this that actually is all that wrong. It's, it's actually fine the way that it's scored. And I, and I really do like this, but it's just the beginning that makes me a little wary. You know, I, I would, I always prefer to have my um, my first horn taking the top voice, just because that's the way that the horn players are used to listening to their harmony. You know, it's like the 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 highest voice is going to be the guide <clears throat> for the other players, right? So if you are sneaking your your first and second under your third and fourth, it's it's you know it's it's not that that is all that wrong. It's just that it's a little weird. Okay. And also, um, maybe it would be better to score this in, um, in in a way that the the first and third and the the second and fourth were were taking the uh, the appropriate roles, right? And then and then then here you could switch back to um, you could either continue on with the second and fourth taking more of a harmonic role, or you could. 
conjoin the you know or un unite the first and second line but it's just a, just a little strange right in here the way that it's scored okay well not to get too sidetracked and all that let's <clears throat> let's start from the beginning look at the treatment of the melody look at the the you know how the harmony is being realized in the and the you know and everything else so if there's one thing that I feel is subtracts a little bit I would I would sense that to be like the constant um, the constant pulse here of the timpani I feel like it's there are like two solutions to this one is to just remove all the accents right until you get to maybe right around here the other thing is just to remove the timpani right or to have it play every other bar and and remove the accent right because I just feel that that constant pounding is you know it's just feels more like a headache to me than like like a the promise of a spring day right with a beautiful sunshine outside the window um okay <clears throat> but that's just you know that's just my personal taste but yeah but you know like you can see here <clears throat> in other parts the uh the low f sharp conforms to the way the piano is um is laid out or the the original piano score now uh here and there you're going to notice that i have reduced staves and uh and taken some out uh as you'll see when i flip to the next screen there are quite a few more percussion instruments and there is also a celesta part and everything else but i just you know i'm just trying to give these screens as much uh vertical space and the and the the largest staff size possible so you can see why it's it's really helpful to have a score that is um, two on a staff, right? At, at least with this kind of evaluation scheme. <clears throat> now, right here, you're sort of marking out this, um, you know, up and then down. Da, da. I mean, mm, mm. yeah, I can I can just imagine that in my mind. Mm, 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 mm. See, but see, what I would want is up down up down up down up down right so it's just that much more natural for me as a string player to you know dun, dun. not that i'm not that i'm a great string player or anything but i just know the technique <clears throat> yeah right and you can just say div period instead of the full written out divisi so here we've got unison violins like you know all 30 players or so just playing that one single united uh melody and then everybody else is sort of taking a position around it in the strings or excuse me in the winds you know above for the flute on that note for the oboes or octave lower for the um or excuse me i should also mention that the clarinets are also on the same pitch and then english horn is taking the octave lower and so on so we have kind of like a triple octave reaching upwards now with this much weight accompanying the strings i, I almost feel like you don't even need the trumpets in there i mean I, it's it's interesting how they are you know they jump down here an octave yeah, and they just, just sort of like cope however best they can so that they don't get too high, so that they're not too bright, right? Uh, yeah, so, all right. Right, okay, so so don't say A1, A2, comma, 3. Just say 1, 2, and 3, and do it right at the beginning of the bar, right? Um, but don't say like, like a ah, one means with one, right? It means with a player, right? So like a ah, one period, just all you have to do is say one period, right? Don't say a ah, one because like it's that's a that's a different kind of a phrase, right? A ah, due or whatever, just like or you know a ah, tray, whatever. It's like it's with that amount of people. It doesn't mean with this player, right? If you want that player, you just write in the number of that player. So you just put 
one, and I would say just write the number one and put it right here. And then two comma three, you would put like, you could just even sort of sneak it into the staff right in here, all right? So that, that would be the way to split this up. And in fact, I would, I would put that in right here. Okay, so um, have a have a two voice part from right here and then put these markings, just put number one period here and two comma three beneath it for the other voice. So that you don't get this sort of split voice thing with the slurs, that's very confusing for the copyist, the score reader and the conductor, okay? All right, um, but you know, uh, yeah, I, I just, anyway, so I just feel that that, uh, I mean, I, I don't I don't know if it's really necessary to have the trumpet in there is, is the main thing anyways, right? Um, now here, uh, we're reaching all the way up to that high F sharp. And I mean, you know, that's just kind of the limit of of a proportional piano. Right, you get a certain, you get up to a certain height with the clarinet, and it starts to just pierce, even even when the player is really controlling it, right? But I mean that that is doable. I'm wondering if you could actually drop the clarinet down earlier, right, and then it could provide more support, just in terms of its overtones to the notes above, right, rather than having to really climb with them, all the way up, right? So supporting the English horn might actually work better earlier on in this particular instance. Okay, um, you know, touch of cymbals is cool. I really like the way that you really are controlling the dynamic curve here. Um, you know, you could be, you could even have marked the horns pianissimo here. But otherwise, I mean, that all works pretty well. So now we we get kind of to the to the heart of the piece, right? The of the of the beginning of the piece. Da 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 ba da da da. And and it's interesting how you like you harmonize that. Da 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 bum, right? And this is intriguing and really a lovely idea. This um, these little doubled pizzicato notes. I, th I think you could have easily um, you could have easily done something like this actually taking it from here, once you've established your particular approach, you could have changed them like this, right? I mean, that, that, that would have been a perfectly acceptable way of doing it, but Everything else right in here, I like the, I like this, um, these kind of arcing pizzicato lines. They're very, very cool. And just notice how, like, not having so much weight on the double bases does does wonders for the lightness of this passage right in here. And just in general, you know, I mean, there is enough pulse here. There is enough motion <coughs> that um, that we do feel the fullness. Uh, even though there are, you know, there's a lot of kind of staticky parts, uh, you know, here in the second second violins, and you know, the, just the way that the oboes are scored with the flutes and and everything else and bassoons. Yeah, so here I feel that this, you know, once again is is going to be more, you know, you, you've got this really nice idea, which is um, is ah to flute and clarinet. Uh, and it goes, it just goes pretty high. You know what I mean? It's, 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 I mean, it's, it's still really controllable. And I mean, I, you know, don't get me, don't, don't get me wrong, but I, I'm just wondering if the blend is all that good for flute and clarinet. Um, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it's a cool color though. I just, just, I wish like maybe if it were down a few notes, you know, like a down by a few pitches. Uh, but I mean, there's there's nothing wrong. I'm just I just I'm just saying note of caution right in here, okay. <clears throat> and of course, like the lovely <laughs> idea of you know this you know in addition to all the other things that you've got going on, this little climbing notes right in here. And yeah, and once again, there's no such thing as ah one and ah two 
like this. This is this means two different things, right? This means hey, with two people. So don't okay. I, have I talked to to you about this before in previous evaluation scores of saying not of not using ah one? See now here you're using it in a different context. Like like you're like before it was just like if you um you know if you had a single player you know you would maybe you would write in ah one right like so like meaning the first player. But don't do that, okay? Look, look, this is all you need, all right? And in fact, I'll tell you something. This is what you need. Nothing, right? And then put this here. We know, you know, we score readers, we conductors, we copyists know that you are going to two voices here and you know, unless there is some reason for like the second player to cross voices with the first, there is no reason for us to write in that the top player is the first player and the bottom player is the second player. We know, right? Right, and I notice you don't mark it here, right? Well, but you wrote simile before, but look, you just don't need that, okay? All right, so, so everybody, please, you know, only use A in front of a number, like A2, A3, when you have those um, those instruments conjoined onto a single voice, right? That is the only only time you should use A1, excuse me, never use A1. You should know only time you should write down A2, A3, A4, whatever. Never use A1, just the number of the player, right? Player number one, player number two, thing number one, thing number two, okay? All right. Okay, um, but I really like the the contrary motion right in here. That's that's really fun. <clears throat> so I think that it it all works pretty well well together. Um, and here you've got what we've got here is like an echo rather than a contrast, right? So bump 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 bump, and wisely you're coming down here in dynamic. But hey, what about your pizzicato people, right? They should at least be playing softer there because if they if the wind players are really paying attention to your um, you know to to being softer here, everybody should come down, including the English horn and the uh, and the bassoon. You, you don't want these accompanying elements to stand out of the music while this very delicate um, this you know very delicate expression of the melody is going on, and especially here too, right? The pizzicato will be louder than you think. Right, so, uh, but you know what's nice is that the harp actually makes sense here. Uh, if everybody really does control their dynamic in here, the harp will stand out beautifully. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> excuse me. It's just a. Uh, it's actually late fall here in uh, in New Zealand, and uh, so just you know seasonal congestion. Don't worry, it's not not anything worse, but. Uh, <clears throat> just a little gunk uh, clogging the pipes. Now I really like this here. Bum 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 bum, and the little roll down here, and a little tish from the cymbals. That's all really really great. Um, here I, I I just see no reason for this to be violas um, with you know divisi. There's nothing about the upper voice here that couldn't be played by the second violin, unless you have like some really specific reason that you wanted the viola timbre there. But the problem with that thinking is that there's nothing about the viola timbre, nothing about the uniqueness of the viola timbre that is going to come through here at all with, you know, as accompanying uh, merging blending with the uh, brass section here. The brass section will basically strip out any kind of timbral um, quality from the strings that is that is unique, you know, of like seconds versus violas. So there really is no need here. <clears throat> you know, you want a thicker sound here if you're playing against the brass. So really, that upper voice should be in the second violins. There's nothing. There's nothing that's out of range for it, right? Now, perhaps it was because you wanted to lift the mutes, right? You have. And okay, so so here's another kind of issue that I've got here. Okay, so pizzicato, consort, 
All right, so you wanted mutes, you wanted muted pizzicato. So, all right, so <clears throat> the thing about that is that muted pizzicato really doesn't... Okay, so like you're, you're trying to score really delicately here, okay? So I accept that, that's fine. But there's, in the context of what you're doing here, the mutes will not do anything for the pizzicato, right? So, so that actually just getting rid of the mutes uh, we'll actually solve this problem so that you can put this upper voice onto the seconds or wherever, all right? Okay. Uh, but as aside from that, this is nicely scored, you know. Um, <clears throat> bum, 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 bum. I really do like the way that you have um, you have apportioned the voices here. I like the little contrary motion in bass trombone and bassoons and bass clarinet and cello. That is a kind of a cool idea. Uh, not that it really comes through all that much, right? It, like a few other people have tried this and you know, we really don't feel the lift of that line unless we're paying attention to it, right? It's like it doesn't really, you know, since it since it is composed of steps that are common throughout the um, throughout the voicings, it, you know, it, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really call itself out. It doesn't, it doesn't really provide much motion. Now, if <clears throat> if we were to have the entire bass line play this in octaves way below, that would be great, except that you wouldn't have that sense of settling on a low note at the end. All right, well, anyways, just like different different possible options and so on. So now we get into da 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 ba da da bum ba da dum bum 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 bum. Okay, and this this is really lovely. And what what I really like about this is like the proportion, right? So you've got this uh, beautiful combination of uh, winds and strings, really more of a wind heavy kind of a sound, and then we've got this really delicate, almost chamber orchestra kind of approach and then you know kind of really this is going to be dominated by brass there's no question about it that's the way you scored it right and then we have the answer right in here just essentially string scoring uh, which eventually gets other colors added to it in uh, in winds and strings so that is a really great idea and and there's really not all, much wrong at all with the way that this is scored. I really do like the way that it that you <clears throat> proportion the voices, you slowly add different elements to it and they're all just really nicely placed. Um, and then you know you get up to this point and then you give us the resolution. Just a single uh, F sharp from your first violins and everybody else just very soft wind uh, wind texture right in here so that works great uh, one thing I just caution about <clears throat> and that is think about how strong the brass are getting in here maybe piano crescendo to mezzo forte here right and and by the way you don't need to do this piano crescendo mezzo forte crescendo Right, it's better to have a destination, right? Like maybe just even score forte here, have one single hairpin going all the way through, right? Uh, and then just have a destination of mezzo forte in, uh, that's what I would do here, mezzo forte in the brass, getting to here, and then single hairpin going to forte by this beat in all the other instruments, all right? Then you have a really beautiful balance, really clear instructions, I just really feel like myself as a player and as a and as a composer I feel that this is really fussy like crescendo up to this blah you know I, I feel it's better just to have a nice smooth arc a, a longer hairpin and the players really know where they're going I mean unless you really have a need to surge up to a certain point and then a gradual from there you know like a just kind of like a a fast crescendo and then a little less of a crescendo but the problem is that you have no destination uh, here so there's no way that we can really assert that you know going up suddenly and then a little less steeply right so since there's no destination dynamic we don't know we don't know about the contour right so that suggests to me that you didn't have it worked out in which case this is fine 
coming in here at mezzo forte just put a forte at the end here and just get rid of this middleman in here right and just make your you know go from p to f sometimes that is a tough one you know i mean we're all supposed to be genius orchestrators and or or aiming for that or have a sense of craft or subtlety or um you know and and yet doing a simple crescendo from p to f can seem <laughs> almost as if we're not composers or like or we're just we're just being blatant but it's it's actually a very useful and honorable dynamic marking to make okay now returning to our main theme da 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 ba da 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 ba 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 so lily is restating it in a really beautiful evocative way and it's nice the way that you orchestrated this however you had this beautiful, clever idea, and now here you're restating that accompaniment idea, right? So I would say come up with something else to do here. Because the first time when I heard this idea, I thought, oh, that was really, really great. Now you're using it again. It's just like, oh, yeah, right. That's that idea again, right? So, so try not to, like, if you're introducing your own ideas, your own material, your own uh, ways of thinking into an orchestration like this, I would say, don't use the same trick twice, All right? Just, yeah, just, um, just come up with some other way of uh, introducing motion into this. Okay, now that aside, just looking at the scorning here, this is really nice. I, I really like this uh, Celesta and Harp idea right in here. Now just, just to make absolutely sure you're aware that uh, Celesta, I, I mean I'm, I'm sure it's obvious to you, but Celesta is, uh, sounds uh, an octave higher than written. So yeah, so this basically these chords are going to be writing over the harp, these harp octaves, right? So the, the left hand chord of the Celesta basically is covering this, right? So I mean there, there will be there will be some clarity of line there in the harp, but it's, yeah, but it's, it's, if the celesta and the harpist are, you know, both playing this with sensitivity, then like, you know, the celesta might cover the harp a little bit. Okay, so some missing dynamics here too. And in terms of the celesta, I mean, it's almost like, what's the point, right? Celesta has dynamics for itself, right? But when you combine it for the, with the rest of the orchestra, forte on the celeste is like mezzo piano for everybody else. So scoring mezzo forte down to piano over and over again, it's almost, you know, I mean, it, you do have to mark it because you do want less force going towards the end, in which case I would say, yeah, take away the accents, right? So you want that whole sense of diminuendo going all the way through, but yeah. I mean, it, it is it is kind of a question whether or not this will really mean anything in the long run, but I, but don't leave it out, right? Okay, um, so this is all going to work fine, um, and uh, apologies about the crowding, right? But if I, you know, you, you have such a big score here that if I were to go to a smaller staff size so that there's more vertical space it would be really hard to read some of the things so i'd rather have things a little bit cramped i'd rather have it hard to read in that other way right but you know once again here we've got you know the 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 incorrect use of a right before a number right just say three that's all you got to do because like, once again i'm going to say this again i really want everybody to remember this for the next uh, for the next orchestration challenge. Don't say A number like A1, right? So never say A1. Only say A2 when you mean with two people, right? Only use A3 when you mean with three people. All right, everybody? So that's really, really important. Don't, you know, you know that would be something that you would heavily want to fix if you were to get this ready for a reading. Okay. Um, so moving on to our last section right in here. Um, 
I really like a lot of what's going on in here. Okay. I I, I feel that it is, a, you know, especially like the chimes right in here. That is so cool. Um, and I like the the uh, stepping on the toes of each subsequent note. That is such, you know, that is just really ingenious. Um, it, it just gives it a wonderful floating character right in there. Okay. Um, now, having said that, I think that you can lose the tenuto accents, right? So t t accented tenuto is a bite at the beginning and then full value for the note, right? So this is just like kind of like, it's almost going to be a a blocky note, right? So imagine a, um, imagine a bracket, like like a staple, right? So just a, a line going up and then, so a line going up and then straight and then down. That is the the feeling of a tenuto. Now just add a little spike to the beginning of that, right? So you have a spike and then drop off, right? So I just don't feel that there's anything about these pitches, right? So so maybe um, maybe the uh, the uh, you know that's giving you what you want in terms of the playback for you know for note performer or whatever. But it's it's not you know it, it just really means something specific, right? And it, you know, and here we're getting into like really high you know, scoring right up here to G in horn, and that's just about you know I mean yeah mezzo forte that makes sense, but like it is really going to stand out. It's going to sort of blare out, and we're taking trumpet all the way up to A here, so. You know that is about as high as you could get and sort of get a mezzo forte against the rest of the orchestra so these right in here the the brass scoring is just going to get quite loud indeed so it's just a question of whether or not you really need those pitches when you know everything else that you've got going on here right it's just that the that broadness of tone and you know is is sort of competing with all of this other delicate stuff that you've got here i know it is massive but it is still intended to be delicate right so i would i would feel that some of this brass scoring in here needs to be a little rewritten to be a little understated a little softer a little bit more in um in registers that don't scream okay for in or or don't don't start to scream. Now this is all lovely right here at the end. I, I just really think you could have scored your brass at like piano, right? And then and then had this other stuff be mezzo forte. It, this it's kind of an interesting interesting how you have conceived the dynamics here to be basically just mezzo forte all the way through. Occasional mezzo piano note. But mezzo forte all the way through uh, mezzo forte diminuendo after each phrase. Uh, whereas Lili's original idea was to just slowly build, like you know, each successive phrase was um, was a little bit bigger and a little bit more, and then right at the end she just pulls the rug out from under you and leaves you with this kind of bright memory, right? So it's it's almost as if she's acknowledging by the time she's finished writing out. The piece that she's she herself is just has this crystallized beautiful memory of what happened right and 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 you know and so that is like that last chord is what she's keeping in her mind right that's that just um lucid glowing memory right so i, I just feel that we're, we're taking a little bit of the drama out of it by uh by having each successive step um, kind of the same dynamic. Um, but not to say that the scoring is ineffective at all. And I can see, you know, if you want that kind of clanging sound here with the, uh, with the tubular bells, then you really do need um, a certain amount of force all the way through. So, so I understand the reason, right? And I really do like just the, you know, the overlapping 
uh, the little overlapping pitches and, and everything else in certain voices. I think that that's a great, great idea. All right. And it also gives like each of these some pep, but just a question of like, do you want that on every single phrase? So anyways, I'll get off my soapbox now, but that was just kind of what occurred to me in that. And then here, I really like the fact that you change the scoring model, right? It's, it's, you have different instruments taking over certain functions, right? And the strings becoming more engaged just simply as a textural device. And I really love the way that you pull back here. Now, if there are no notes that are falling on the beat with which to contrast the, um, the adding of a grace note, then the grace note is meaningless, right? Because it's just adding length to the fermata, right? So the, there is there, okay, the thing about a grace note is a grace note is, it's either, it, it's basically adding something before a perceptible downbeat or a perceptible beat, right? So there is no perceptible beat here, right? The, the, all of the instruments that are playing the grace note are coming together and there is no downbeat, right? So there's no downbeat in any other instrument for which from which this could be differentiated, right? So the grace notes are basically meaningless. So it's just really better just to get rid of the grace notes and have everybody play there because like what this does is this creates like all the players are going to have to grace note before the uh, stroke of the conductor unless the conductor says I'll give you the grace note, right? And then and then I'll just hold for everybody else and then I'll can then I'll give you a slight nod as I go to the beat number two right so it just it just creates more problems than than you might think just give yourself a nice long fermata there okay and then the rest of it harp celesta um, you know muted strings there's plenty of time to put the mutes on that's really really great um, and just this just this lovely kind of radiant scoring here with the other winds and this is very cool right in here now um, yeah, I, I think this works really, really well. Just the, the way that this is all laid out. Yep. Yep. That is, that is such a cool idea right in there. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah. Yeah, so I just really have no problem with that. And I also like the, the, um, jumping up an octave and then ending. So that, that is actually something I haven't seen yet in other evaluations, so, or perhaps I'm not remembering, but it works really, really great. And to have it really, really simple, pizzicato double basses and staccato harp, I think that all works really, really well. Um, you might not even need the staccato mark. You could just have like the, just have the, the shortness of the, uh, of the of the time value is probably good enough, I would say. Okay, so once again, apologies for really cramming everything down to such a t you know just really kind of makes this reading a bit tortuous. But but you know, guaranteed that it would be even harder to read if I had reduced the staff size. There's a lot of cool stuff in here that I didn't address, but I'm sure other people will have some comments, and I and I really hope that other um, other people who are entrants to this phase, the um, the Brev entries, will comment on your score, and that you'll comment on their score, right, if you haven't already. So people are starting to comment more on the scores. I was a little worried a couple weeks ago when I had um, mentioned that, like, nobody had really started to comment on each other's scores yet, and I think it was just people kind of getting into the swing of it. So I, I, I don't think there was any, um, I don't think there was any carelessness or, or taking for granted kind of intended, but it just, sometimes people are, you know, they, they actually say, oh, I don't know what to say, right? Um, and that's okay, just compliment in that case, right? <laughs> uh, you know, especially if you really liked something. And, that, that, and it, you know, that makes a big difference for a lot of players. So, or excuse me, for a lot of um, 
uh, people who are entering this this uh, this challenge. So, anyhow, David, like it's really great to get another one of these scores from you, and you know you've been a regular contributor to these challenges. And yeah, I was really hoping that I would see a score from you this time, and I did. And it's great, and and I really, you know, it's great to look at it, and I also really appreciate your, um, you know, your long time support on Patreon. It's really made a big difference as well, and you've always had great comments and and suggestions uh, for the community, and and that is also appreciated. So so thanks again for uh, for this entry, and and for me, I will see if I can evaluate another score or two today uh, if I get a chance and uh, apologies to everybody for kind of the slow release of these um, of these evaluations it's just that uh, YouTube is taking more time to process the uh, uh, the scores and I, I've noticed that it was that some of these evaluations were being turned out and they were and they were at a very low um, a resolution for the first few hours it, which is something I thought that had been solved but now apparently it's it hasn't so that's has slowed us down so anyways thanks everybody thank you David and now for me on to the next evaluation